Okay, we're live. What is this, Lady Ada? Hey, everybody, and welcome to another 7.30 p.m. action-packed show-and-tell. It's me, Lady Ada, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. We're here at the Adafruit Factory, where we do all the design, electronic, soldering, kitting, shipping, support, programming, and all the other good things that come in black boxes, Adafruit black boxes. And uh, tonight, we're going to have some wonderful people show off their projects. You're welcome to join us every Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m., but for now... We have some wonderful Adafruit peeps and others out of here at 7.50, so take two, three minutes, show off your project, start off with Tony. Tony D, what you got going on? Hey, uh, yeah, so I've got a cool uh, project to show. If you go to the Learn System, you can look at the Cyber Flower, the Digital Valentine. So these are a couple flowers, and you can build, basically take an artificial flower, and there is a Gemma M0 inside of these flowers that's lighting up the dot star LED. So it's doing a cool little rainbow animation. I turn the lights down so you can kind of see it in the dark, like the whole flower lights up, it's really pretty. The cool thing is though, on the stem, you can see I put some wires and if I touch them, basically if I hold the flower, then it changes the animation. So it does a neat little pink heartbeat animation. And it's all cool, it's circuit Python code that's powering this, um, it's Gemma M0. Really easy to build because the dot star is built into it. So it's literally the Gemma just on a flower and a couple wires to do the capacitive touch sensing. Uh, and then the neat thing is with the code, you can look at it, you can edit it, you can change like the color of the heartbeat. It's just a hue that you can change uh, the value of for that. So that's a kind of cool thing. Check it out on learn.adfruit.com. Uh, it was just published this week. And then I was also in some spare time, I got the Sino bit, which uh, I'm also wearing on my shirt here. And this is the basically the Chinese version of the micro bit. And I, you guys have talked about it a lot before. Naomi Wu and some folks uh, in uh, Shenzhen built a version of the micro bit that has more LEDs. So 12 by 12 matrix of LEDs. So it can actually display like Mandarin and Chinese characters. Uh, and because it's micro bit based, it can run micro Python. So I took the MicroPython port for the uh, micro, uh, micro bit and put in some extra code, some C functions that let you control the display because the display on this uses a special driver chip. And so this is actually Python code that's animating my Sino bit right now. It's doing kind of this cool little, uh, eventually this will be an arc reactor because, hey, that fits pretty well on this shirt. You know, I don't know, I have to find out what the uh, the Mandarin characters are for Iron Man or something and uh, maybe have it show that also, but be a cool, could be the first wearable Sino bit project also. So maybe more in the future with uh, the Sino bit and MicroPython. Okay, great All update, right. Tony D, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Newman Pedro. Hello, everybody. Hi. So this week we have a 3D printed media dial running off CircuitPython. So there's a, a Trinket M0 on the side there, and you can do three functions. So you can have it go, um, right now I just have it controlling the brightness on the screen. So you can kind of see it dim and then brighten back oh, wow. up. And then we have uh, an escape button, which I won't push because it'll I think it'll log me out of uh, Hangouts. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. super easy, uh, dual extruded design. All the files are available. And on the inside, it's just a rotor rotary encoder with a new pixel ring to display where you are turning. Super granular, so uh, like really good to control, like say your timeline, you're editing video or long documents. Yeah, uh, you can kind of make it do anything you want, right? Mm -hmm. And it's pretty quick to kind of look up the key codes and, ch and change them out to make kind of custom macros and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and it's replacing, yeah, the <laughs> old style um, power mate that we had like, yeah. what, like 20 years ago or something. Super editable, uh, all the designs parametric. You can make even this teeny tiny little bit. <laughs> I just want to make a simple like modular keyboard or something like that. And it's same thing, all snap together design. Well, Trinket M0 inside there. And because it's circuit Python, it just loads like a regular USB drive. So you can edit all your code inside there. Got a whole guide and 3D Hangouts. We showed off how to edit the design and all that. So check all that out if you're interested in building your own. Excellent work. I love the the translucent light. Mm -hmm. it's a really it's a, you did a really good job and we're gonna we're gonna throw this away. No, it's kidding. No. <laughs> I'm going to put there it in my go. giant bin of things that don't work anymore that yeah. we'll make new and better versions of. Yeah, I, know. I, I, I felt bad throwing ours away, too. <laughs> it's got a nice aluminum, nice machine. It is yeah. nice. All right, well, thank you. All right, we'll nice be start. playing those videos on our show tonight. Next thank up, you. Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Hey, um, I'm here to show off my new 3D printed light strand. Um, you can see the whole thing on the wall behind me being a rainbow on the rainbow, which is fun. Um, but I, I modeled a basically an Adafruit Starflower kind of star, uh, my 3D printer in Fusion 360, and I put these clips on the back that just clip perfectly onto this uh, NeoPixel strand. This is a four-inch pitch NeoPixel strand. 
So I can just uh, just pop it on there, and then the whole flower just glows. Um, and it's really pretty. It's really fun. I'm using a circuit uh, playground to run it and uh, just did the programming and make code, which is pretty fun because I've got the light sensor set up. So I have a flashlight right here. I'm just going to shine this at the circuit playground. And when I do that, the light actually goes off. Um, so it's light sensitive. It's just set up so that if you have it, I don't know, out in your yard during the daytime, the lights will be off. But as soon as it gets dark, they'll come on automatically, which is cool. Um, and I'm almost finished with the tutorial. The guide's going to be up probably later this week or next week. Amazing. Thank you so much, Aaron. Rocking through it. Aaron. Okay, next up is Chris Young. Chris Young, what you got going on this week? Can you hear me? Yeah. Wait up. Press Alt Tab. Press Alt Tab. Click Minimize. Hang on a sec. Okay. Seven, nine, eight. Click. There we go. All right. Go to sleep. Hello. Um, anyway, uh, first I want to announce that my infrared library. Hang on. Go to sleep. Don't want to be dictating in the middle of this. Anyway, my infrared library now supports Trinket M0 and Gem M0. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a problem with it. A couple of the pins that I think ought to work are not working. And I haven't quite figured out why, but I'm hoping that someone out there, once they get to play with the code, will be able to help me with out with that. But uh, it does work on at least two of the pins for the uh, trinket and one of the pins on the gemma. The other ones don't work. And they should, but they don't. So, so much for that. Another project here. Uh, last April, I showed I built this little 3D printed stand to set my iPad on my nightstand next to me so that when I'm laying in bed and laying on my side, I can work my iPad using a Bluetooth switch control. But for various reasons, I don't lay on my side much anymore. So I wanted to mount the iPad on top of my TV. So here, here's the old stand just sitting on my dresser. This is a new uh, bracket that I designed in Fusion 360. Combine that with a, a bracket that I had previously designed in Blender. And here they are printed out. And here they are. We screwed them into the uh, unused screw hole in the visa mount on the back of my TV. There it is with the iPad sitting in it. There's a front view. Uh, the device on the right is my famous remote control, remote control that I first showed off on Show and Tell back in late uh, hey, sticker. 2013. <laughs> my very first SCNR Show and Tell sticker ever is still there. Uh, then also, this is an old photo of my first computer. And wow. this last week was the 40th anniversary of a blizzard that we had here in the Midwest, the famous blizzard of 78. And I sat around for three days. The whole city was shut down. Nobody was working. Did nothing but read old bite magazines. And after doing that for three days, I said, I've got to have a personal computer. So <laughs> this week or next, whenever the thaw came, that I first started doing this computer. Now, this photo shows it several years later, right, after it had some upgrades, that IBM typewriter had been modified with some solenoids and connected to an interface box, and I could use it as the printer for the computer. Uh, here's a close-up, a couple of floppy disk drives up on top of it. My dad built that cabinet for me and uh, built that fancy keyboard case. My dad's a sheet metal worker, so he can make anything out of me. And he built me that fancy case for the cherry keyboard. Here's a close-up of the inside of the machine. It was S100 bus, and left to right we have uh, a 16K memory board, a floppy disk controller, another 16K memory board, an 8K ROM board with a with a ROM burner. You can see the ZIF ZIF sockets there, little green ZIF sockets, zero and first zero insertion force sockets that you would plug the ROMs in to program them. Uh, the next one is the 
different brand of memory board. The next one to the right is the Z80 processor board. You can see a tall white chip there about halfway up that's the Z80 processor. Uh, the next one is a serial and parallel and cassette tape I.O. board. And the board on the far right is the memory map video board. That, that first memory board there, the one with the white stripes on it, was built by a company called Seattle Computer Products. And I'm wondering if you trivia people know what Seattle Computer Products is really most famous for. And if anyone knows uh, or doesn't know, come back to me at the very end, and I'll tell you what yeah. their biggest claim to fame is. I'm not going to Google it because it seems unfair. No, All right. no, you know you All right, well, thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Okay. All right, we'll come back to you at the very end. Yeah. Special. Cliffhanger Maybe. trivia question. All right. <laughs> Katni. Hello, hey, Katni. How you doing? Hi, I'm good. So I've been working on a project with hacking IKEA lamps. And I have two of them here. I have this guy and I have this little guy here. Um, and I wanted to make them interactive. So I, I gutted this one. Uh, Circuit Playground Express fits perfectly into the bottom of it. And right now, if you rotate it to the left, it turns on. If you rotate it to the right, it changes the speed of the setting. And if you tap it twice, it changes the um, whatever the, the mode is. And then if you shake it, it turns off. And this one runs with an IR remote. So you can change the color from however far away you want. Um, you can change the brightness. And you can turn it off. So when you're ready to go to sleep, shut it off. Done. Yay. So both of those are done with Circuit Playground Express. Um, and uh, Circuit Python is running both. Nice work. OK. Thanks. Cool looking lamps. Thank All you, right. Katie. Next yeah. up, Blitz City. Hello, Blitz City. How are you? Welcome back. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, so I published my second learn guide this week on the GoPro Lite, so that was cool. Uh, and thank you for encouraging me to do the CircuitPython version. That was a really cool adventure. Um, <laughs> so um, project mm -hmm. I'm working on this week, uh, cameras going down to the dead. <laughs> um, Ooh. It's kind of a riff on the potentiometer with the GoPro. Like I do a lot of NeoPixel projects, and um, sometimes I have a hard time dialing in exactly what color I want to use. Um, so I'll like kind of default to using 255 or 127 values. Um, but I wanted to build something to kind of dial it in properly. So I have three potentiometers uh, that are each controlling the different values of the colors RGB. And then it unfortunately doesn't show up on camera because it's too bright, but I've got uh, one of the 16 by two LCDs and it's showing the um, number value for each um, RGB value. So I can see exactly what I've like dialed in. So I mix them together, you can get like different colors. So yeah. Um, and then this project I'm gonna do, camera going back up. Uh, I'm gonna do, uh, try to do a snap fit case for the first time following one of the tutorials you guys have. Um, so that the pots will be on the top and I can see the screen. Uh, it's running on a Feather M0. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. okay. Keep up the nice good work. work. Thanks. All right. Next up, Carson. Hello, Carson. I think we're. Okay. Is my mic finally working? Yeah. Yay! Told, told you it would work out. Yeah. Yes. Yay! Okay. So um, first of all, uh, my I got some Ninja Flex today for my 3D printer. And I've been trying to figure out how to get it working and everything. I had some problems, so I don't really have anything to show with it. But uh, yeah, so I hope to print something out with that. Okay. And then also, um, I added some more stuff to this. This is my. Uh, this is going to be a safe. So oh. this will open no, and close. Sense. Things were moving around. It looks like it was turning something last week. I was week like, I don't know. We were playing Maker's Trade. <laughs> now it all makes sense. These, uh, I added another syringe here. There's, so there's more syringes. And then there's, I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. There is copper tape. Um, and then there's a little copper tape on the end of the syringe. So when um, that copper tape is touching the other copper tape on the, um, on, in the box, then it bridges it. And then I have a trinket M0 here. 
And then when that detects when all three are uh, in the right position, so bridging the connection with the conductive tape, then it has like the circuit here to turn on a motor, and then that will go to this pulley here and let down this wall. So uh, I'll try to show it. So there's one syringe moving there. Okay. Uh, there's another syringe moving there. And the last syringe, sort of hard to see, moving there. Okay. And then. Hmm. Okay, so what, I don't know if it went or not, but there should have been a red LED right here that would light up, and then the relay would go, and then that lets that down. Okay. All right, good stuff. This is looking awesome. Coming yeah. soon to Ocean's 11 Maker I like Edition. Your, I like your exotic uh, yeah. inputs. Like Most people just go with buttons, and you're like, no, I got these syringes. Yeah, cool. Well, it, I, um, for school... For our um, uh, sci for the end of our science unit, which is on uh, fluids, we need to have some sort of hydraulics project. So I was like, how could I incorporate electronics into this? <laughs> so I decided, hey, uh, I can make a safe with this. So I came up with a design. Originally, I was going to use capacitive touch, but then that didn't turn out to work as... Uh, the, sy the syringes don't have enough capa capacitance. So um, I realized that I could just use it almost as if it was a switch. So... Um, You're great. Yeah. This is cool. And you get an asking on the show and tell Sticker which you can lock up safely. In the All right. Thank you, Carson. <laughs> All right. Come Thank back you. next week. Okay, next up, Adam. Hello, Adam. Unmute your mic and show us your project. How's it going, Hey, Adam? guys. Um, this is my long-range wireless to your camera. Um, I chose this project because I wanted to eliminate the need for onboard storage. Typical trail cams, you they take pictures and they write the images to SD cards and then you have to go and collect the images. Yeah. Uh, I wanted something that was more real time. I didn't want to have to go up to the trail cam to get the image and I didn't want to have to pay for a cellular plan for every one of the cameras that I had out there. So I wanted something that was kind of like a local private network that I could send these images across and have one endpoint that had an internet connection that could route those images out. Uh, so this is what I came up with, and the camera board you can see here has a, a PIR sensor motion detector. There's a camera above it. This is a just a JPEG camera with a TTL interface, mm -hmm. and the wire that's coming out here is an Ethernet cable. Um, I want it because if you could imagine, I wanted to have the the transmitter which is sitting on the top of this. I wanted to have that 20, 40 feet up in the air, so I needed to have a cable that had really good shielding on it. So I chose to use just an Ethernet cable. I'm just using four pins on it, RXTX power ground. I'm going to take this thing off here. Um, the controller board for this is a is the Adafruit Pro Trinket board. You can see that in there without the glare. I'm using one of the, the perma boards too, just to solder to it. Uh, it's running off of four AA batteries, and I have a couple jumper pins in there so I can quickly switch out different Arduino programs just as using just hardware feature toggles without having to upload new programs. There's about three programs that run off of this Pro Trinket board and I'm just switching them with the jumper pins. And so when this thing takes a picture, it's using the the XB radios and I have the, the Adafruit shield on those, but it's sending those across to a receiving radio, which I have hooked up to my laptop here. And when this radio receives the, the JPEG image, it publishes it to a Elixir server that's running off of WebSockets. And so I have a little tablet here that just has a WebSocket connection to that server that's running on my laptop. Yeah. And anytime a new image comes across, it just updates the, the image on the browser here. And okay. I also incorporated push notifications. So it's, it's hooked up with Android as well. So that you can also receive these on your phone directly if you're not looking at a, a browser on a tablet. All right, uh, this Amazing. is really impressive for the folks who, knows what, who know what this is, a real-time trail camera. Um, Congratulations. Good nice work. work. Um, I'll send you a sticker. <laughs> Thank you. It's vital. It can yeah. survive the Email support at adafruit.com. And um, you know, next time you build one, let us know. Maybe we can help um, send out some, some free gear for you. OK, cool. All right. OK, so we're still going to get everyone in. We're going to go to Dan, and then we're going to go to Adam, and then we're going to go to C. Scott. So if everyone keep it to like one or two minutes, we can get everyone in. Dan, in. Yeah. Mike, you chose your project. Hey, folks. Hey, guys. 
Um, got a couple different ones and uh, and a special guest. Oh, hey. <laughs> can, uh, can't really see her. There she is. Hi, Katie. <laughs> um, me and uh, I lucked out, found a uh, local guy selling a couple doll houses. Um, was only going to pick up this one and he ended up giving me this too. Like a All humongous right. barn. Um, but this one's first. Uh, Mia's got me uh, decorating it up all nice and goth for her monster high dolls. So, oh, cool. I don't know if you guys remember that. Noe and Pedro did a really awesome full size one of those. So, yeah, we got furniture and. You got a cat monster. Yeah. What's that? You get cat monster. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and speaking of the cat monster, um, a project uh, that I don't know if any other cat lovers will want to do, but um, our dear, wonderful little friend in there, uh, she does her business and she can peel paint. Um, so I'm using this old dresser, which is kind of on its side at the moment, so forgive. Um but this tote is going to be the litter box, and I'm going oh, to cool. bring in. These are fancy this cats. Air cleaner. Oh yeah. So, even the kitties can have a, uh, a stinky free place to do their business. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thanks for the update. Well, this looks cool. Thank you, cat, and thank you, human assistant. All right. Well, I'll send out an email to support it. Effort. There's plenty of room in that. Glamorous cat house for as you know in the show and tell sticker. Okay, we're gonna go to Adam and then we'll wrap up with C Scott. Hello. Hello. Hey. So uh pretty cool news this week. I got high resolution capture working. Uh not digitally, of course. Uh, this whole thing's analog still, but I have a DSLR with a 50 millimeter lens. And right behind uh this panel right here, there is another CRT monitor that you know you can't really see it right now, but it's really high resolution CRT. So I can point this camera at that CRT and get some pretty interesting results. And I will go ahead and show those real quick. So we can actually uh, achieve some uh, pretty uh, nice quality captures. And what's also really cool is that this is a capture at 100,000 times magnification, which is the first time I've ever gotten the scope up to anything remotely that close. Uh, it still has a 60 hertz noise problem, but I was able to figure out kind of what it is, and it was my own fault of a decision I made back in October. Uh, the power supply for this uh, SEM requires 100 volts AC. Well, we have 120 in the United States, so I have a large variac that powers that. That variac has a large uh, field around it, and I had it located uh, perfectly, the total rate of the variac was perfectly on plane with the scan column, which is a recipe on how to bend your electron beam using a variac. So got that moved, got some, uh, got rid of that 60 hertz noise more or less, and got some really great high quality pictures. Nice so, <laughs> uh, the other thing you can do with SCN that's pretty fun though is beyond just taking high resolution pictures, is actually get some chemical information about the sample. And I haven't really done much of that, but I've got a detector here that specializes in that. It's called backscatter electron. Now, there's two types of electrons you normally use: secondary electron, backscatter electron. Secondary electron kind of just comes off the surface of the sample. As if it's conductive, somewhat regardless of the material, but backscatter electron actually bounces back out of the sample. And about more electrons bounce out for uh, elements that have a higher atomic number. So you can use that to actually create contrast based on the chemical composition of something. So I've got my backscatter detector set up and running. It's uh, pretty well uh, dialed in right now. And I'm just going to get my camera pretty close to the CRT here so you can get a good view of it. And under here, we've got the sci-fi chip. Uh, now, the sci-fi is interesting because it's got a lot of really cool uh, manufacturing processes on it. But as we start to zoom in, and I go to wrap it so I can reposition real quick because I realize I'm in the wrong section of the chip for this to be interesting on, uh, we can see that we have a lot of contrast, even though there's not much surface detail. And so what this is showing is actually where different elements in the chip are used. These chips are way less mechanical design and more so chemistry, really. There's uh, just getting the, uh, the different effects you can, or the different uh, physical phenomena you uh, can get in semiconductors to happen requires a bunch of different elements. And this backscatter detector does some really cool stuff in viewing them. So if I really start to zoom in here, uh, go ahead and go to 10 to the 2, and back to slow scan, 
we can actually almost see through the chipsum. You can actually see a lot of different layers and the different uh, and the contrast based on the different elements they use in those different layers. So this is a really cool tool for doing uh, reverse engineering work or just looking at the chemical composition of different samples. Okay, thank you so much. That's cool. Great stuff. I'm learning stuff. Yeah. Okay, see Scott, and then we're gonna check in with um, Kristen. I have some guesses, but um, we're gonna we're gonna check in at the end for the trivia question. All right, see Scott. Hey guys. Here, the it's stuck. The covers, the panel covers for the module playground finally came in. So uh, as soon as I uh, get another board, send one off. We got create some general mayhem, and I'll send a couple sample programs with it. But uh, also of interest is we needed a quick solution for a small uh, display screen. I'm going, hey, I know who has those. Yeah. So uh, I got that, and you can see the back is our little Arduino Nano sitting there. And the idea is we wanted to look through the lens of a transit at some pictures. And here is a, a lens eye view of a sample picture. Okay. The uh, last thing is when things I think that are pretty cool happen, I tend to write some thoughts down, and I thought I would give you a quick uh, 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 run down on what I wrote yesterday. I wrote today's first flight of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy illustrate two things so necessary in our lives. Dedication to a kind of shared dream that pushes the edge of technology forward, but perhaps more importantly, the whimsy to do so in such a way uh, as to be best remembered as a work of art. The old masters of science fiction were uh, very romantic about space travel, writing down their visions so that perhaps some portion of their love for the idea found its way into the hearts of not just their generation, but uh, those going forward. I think Elon Musk understands this quite well, choosing to make an admittedly rather expensive artistic statement thinly disguised as a heavy lifting vehicle test. But in future years, a statement that will look uh, quite economical compared to the paths now open to us. So uh, everything everybody gathers here to do, if you're watching, if you're making, if you're thinking about making, just go look at Starman and, and that's what you can do. Yeah, you have to start somewhere, and I guarantee you it's going to have something to do with, about, uh, with electronics and probably Python at some point. SpaceX is a customer of ours. We can never talk about what they buy from us, but I can tell you that um, all things are connected. Um, if you send me that text, um, I'll post it up on the blog, but you can also, um, you have you have privs, you can post it up. That's My co-worker's brother works there, too, so okay. yeah, we're all connected. All right. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so we're much. all doing it together. Like, yeah. really. Like, there's only yeah, 2,000 people. <laughs> yeah, we, we all really need <laughs> to make it work. All right, so um, thank you so much, C. Scott. All right, Chris, I have a guess. Oh, is Chris still here? He's muted. Oh, no, his camera went out. OK. I don't know. I think Chris went out. Because the, there was a trivia question that you want to say. What is Seattle computing? Yeah, what did Seattle computing? So my okay. guess my guess is, yeah. and, and someone can post in chat. This is my guess. Not, I didn't like look it up or anything. It must have something to do with Microsoft. Because Seattle computers. Seattle, yeah. yeah maybe they were. Paul Allen. Maybe it was the first. I'm thinking licensee it, of DOS. I'm thinking it's something like that, but everyone can post up in the Maybe chat. And Chris can Oh yeah. 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 Okay, that was. Did you hear, Actually, I guess. Yes, you said it had something to do with Microsoft, but you've got it backwards. Microsoft bought MS DOS. Ah, oh, was pretty cool. Seattle computer products. All right. They owned it themselves, and Bill Gates bought it from them for fifty thousand dollars. It's a good deal. And then resold it. To IBM as PC DOS, and then rebranded it themselves as MS DOS, and made billions and billions of dollars off of it. I heard the guy that originally wrote it; they finally did uh, make a new deal with him. Yeah, hired him as a consultant and gave him a salary at Microsoft because they they did kind of screw him over buying this multi-billion-dollar piece of software for 50k. Yeah. He, he wasn't interested in selling software. He was a hardware guy, and he wrote this DOS just so he'd have something to, to run on his new 16-bit cards. And Gates bought it from him for pennies, and and uh, the rest is history. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, okay. for Computer History tonight. You can actually right. learn right. today. All right. Thank you, Nome Pedro. Thank you, Katney. Thank you, Dan and Ann. Cat friend. Thank you, C. Scott. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Let's see. Thank you Adam. And thank you, Adam. Yeah. Um, we'll see everybody next week. We're going to be on Ask an Engineer in like 30 seconds. We're making this the best half an hour of our week every week. Thank you, everybody. See, Scott's playing some music, so.
Play some some good tronics. I guess. <laughs> Okay, bye everybody. To space and beyond.